Hello, everyone. Hello. And uh, welcome to the Hyperthesis Podcast. Uh, my name is Patrick. My name is Svili. My name's Liam. All right, and we are back on the second episode. Ooh. Um, so, a little recap of the first episode. We discussed Liam's research, basically, on acoustic black holes and, you know, and whatnot, both Einstein condensates, and the techniques, the mathem- mathematical theory of... Um, catastrophe theory and we ended it with um, a little story time of uh, extraterrestrial life and our search for it and our little evidence or biggest evidence that we have had so far so in our first episode we didn't actually mention the origins of the podcast originally it was a radio show at saint francis xavier university where we all did our undergrad uh, and it actually won the best new show of the year for I believe it was 2018, 2017, 2018. And so we wanted to continue the show. And even though we are on separate sides of the country, uh, a podcast is a perfect opportunity to continue talking physics and science. So with that being said, uh, talking about science, does anyone have any interesting topics they would like to discuss? I noticed today, getting back on my catastrophe theory rant as, as I do, I noticed um, when when I was pouring water out of a pot that it kind of makes like this cuspy shape when it comes out. So I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And when when I looked at it a bit closer, it kind of looks like a Piercy function. And I, you know, scavenged the internet for for everything to see if I could see anything, see if see if anyone's noticed that before. And if people've noticed it, they haven't written about it. So I might uh might look into that. Well, you said the scale of of the Piercy, you know, undulations it, uh, in nanometer scale, right? Like, how can you even see that? That's for um, that's for visible light. So it, it has to do with the wavelength of whatever whatever wave. So, you know, light's a particle and a wave, and in the wave picture, it has a wavelength. Um, so so water waves would have a different wavelength. But like, if you had, you know. If you, were, if you were at a beach and you had like a plane wave coming in, so like a, a wave coming up to the shore, but you put like a big semicircular wall in the water, it'd behave the same way as light does in the coffee mug. Um, maybe if, if, if you wanted to see that Piercy behavior, you'd have to kind of match the wavelength of the, of, of the, you know, the waves coming in to the shore to the uh, kind of size of that. Uh, semicircular wall, but should still see it. I mean, if you look at the mathematical construction of the Piercy function, it doesn't look like something you see casually. It, it, it looks complicated, you know? It's, it's not like yeah. F equal MA or some, some other, you know, linear equation you expect from you, what, you, what you see easily. Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of like how, you know, in the double slit experiment, you have like a plane wave and then suddenly it goes through two slits, and those two slits create an interference pattern. And you get those spherical waves coming out, and they, they overlap, and you get constructive and deconstructive interference. It's it's kind of similar, where you have like a plane wave reflecting off the back of this. But yeah, you get this plane wave kind of reflecting off this semicircle, and what ends up happening is you get constructive and destructive interference in certain spots. So you get those kind of like dot-looking bumps everywhere. Anyway, I noticed something like that when pouring water out of a cup or a mug or a pot or whatever. I think it has to do with that. Were you looking for it? No, I just noticed it. I noticed that in this cusp shape that came out of the pot, I thought I saw like kind of little little bumps. I'm going to look more into that. Maybe I should drink more coffee. Yeah, it's just like I don't drink, really drink coffee, so maybe I never noticed this piercy function. We have to ask the coffee experts around. Oh, I don't drink coffee either. So we're probably the only two physics students who uh, don't drink coffee, honestly. I, too, do not drink coffee. <laughs> no, I only drink coffee when it's offered to me. I was like, oh, you want coffee? I'll, I'll drink coffee. But I wouldn't go out of my way to, to brew myself a cup of coffee. Yeah, I don't want to become dependent uh, dependent on it because I know I will <laughs> the moment I start drinking it. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to look into that eventually. I, I think it makes sense because you have waves going over kind of like a semicircular edge and you kind of get like disturbances in them 
it makes sense to me, but I, it could just be fluid mechanical stuff that I don't know about, so I could be horribly wrong. So that, that kind of triggers something else in my mind where, you know, when you, you pour something and it's very smooth, almost like laminar flow, but it does that kind of almost weaving pattern where it will go from like one plane and then further down the stream it will twist 90 degrees and then further down will twist. Oh, I, I'm curious if that's related to what you're seeing at all. I, I, I don't know at all, but it would be interesting to see if those two phenomena are related. Like the flow shape? Yeah, the flow yeah, shape. I wonder, is it because like uh, some part is already uh, fo- follow certain trajectories, that's why it's twisted, or is it, I think a lot might have to do with surface tension. It does have to do with surface tension, actually. I spent many hours today trying to Google the uh, the thing I was just talking about to see if anyone else noticed it, and you just find a lot of you know, physics stack exchange questions on why does why does water do that when you're pouring it out? Why does it look like like a kind of it has polarization where it kind of goes like it, it has like transverse movement and it kind of looks like DNA as it flows down and that's mm-hmm. it's something to do with surface tension. Um, I didn't quite read into it because I was more focused on you know my Piercy functions that I that I love. I mean, you you can see that those behavior in author fluid too like you have like really sticky you know those liquid candy when they make candy that's i think that's more of a external force which i think imitate gravity and you start pulling those really thick candy Mm -hmm. and uh, to pull it and you can see those kind of flow because you know if it's not um viscous enough uh, you can still see the flow to it so it is to have shape I think this might be easier to study than than very very um, you know fast flowing water. Yeah, you want like a nice viscous material to be able to experiment with. Yeah, if you remember some of the labs, or well, uh, we haven't done, or maybe we have the um, viscosity of oil. Right, is 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 easier to drop a metal ball and measure, you know, the speed or velocity or time rather than drop in water, which is take like. A second or two to get to the bottom but if you have like a machine oil or something it's, it's more viscous yeah i took a uh took a half semester fluid mechanics course last year so the more viscous something is the more laminar it is you gotta get your reynolds number as they call it it's the ratio basically of how fast it's going to how viscous it is Turn, laminar flow is cool, but the turbulence is where it's at. That's what we don't. That's what we struggle to model. Yep. They also say turbulence is can be as complicated as quantum mechanics. People are still haven't figured it out, and there's a lot of numerical research on turbulence and whatnot. Yeah, quantum mechanics is nice because you're dealing with these linear Schrodinger equations a lot of the time. Not all the time. I I don't deal with linear equations, unfortunately, but. Well, the uh, the fluids people also have the Navier-Stokes equation, yep. right, which is uh, another PDE, I believe. That's the killer. That's the thing that we don't know how to model very well. That's you need like supercomputers to numerically model that kind of stuff. It's ridiculous. It is still fascinating, though, how much of that motion can be described by equations, though, for how chaotic it is. Uh, when I took a kind of a fluid dynamics class but it was more so on oh. waves and stability we oh, I'm learned so jealous that... it, it, it was an excellent course uh if anyone is doing physics at the university of alberta check out bruce sutherland or just check him out anyways excellent person and excellent professor we in that course discussed the different creation and motion of waves and even with instabilities in a system it's incredible how well it can be mapped just by a couple equations and it's not something you would think would be possible given what we know about turbulence and its complications but there is still some simplified cases where we can actually map what's going to happen or or simulate it quite relatively easily still you, you may still need a supercomputer but it's certainly not as complicated as tracking every particle in a in a simulated fluid. All right. So since we got into the topic of what you do and you know what you have done, Patrick, would you like to 
get into your research a little bit. So I think last week you mentioned that you did some work on you know forestry and re- remote sensing on was it um, um what's it called life in the forest. Yes. So can you tell us some more about that? Yes. Um. So just a bit of background. I do have a physics background, as I mentioned last week, but I've left that world, even though I'm still a physicist. And as Liam pointed out last week, he still sees me as a physicist. So thank you. Um, I did work on dark matter before working on this forest stuff. And truly, it's fascinating how little we know about the world and this research is trying to illuminate some ways in which we can better observe the world so what i do is a field called remote sensing so remote sensing is where we remotely observe something so in this case i remotely observe forests now the method for observing changes whether using lasers or just cameras or specialized cameras that have a higher visibility or a longer range of wavelengths that can see or even radar there's also remote sensing where we can actually go into a forest and observe what's happening there but without having to be intrusively cutting down trees measuring them and whatnot that is still done to some extent but we're trying to move away from that because it is destructive and may not necessarily be the best for forests but overall well i think like what like remote sensing like a forest has like millions of tree for you take a picture each tree could be like a dot is that true or is it that you have like a like a very lo- like a lot of information on like one tree or is it like very like um, microscopic well it, it it depends on what you're trying to observe and how you're observing it which is a very broad answer more specifically, it depends on what you're using for remote sensing. So if you're down in a forest, you can see the individual trees. You can count them. Here's an oak, here's an elm, here's a pine kind of thing. And you can also use remote sensing sensors. For example, a laser scanner, which is a light uh, detection and ranging method or LIDAR. If you've heard of radar, it's very similar to Uh, to LiDAR. But what we can do is we can place one of these sensors, it can scan a full 360 degree field of view, and you can pick out individual trees from that. However, if you're in space and you're trying to observe entire forests, it might be a bit too much data to actually observe every single tree in that forest. So in terms of data and actual physical capability of these sensors, it is easier to have a lower resolution so instead of observing one tree you might have just a pixel that's say 20 meters by 20 meters or 30 meters by 30 meters so covering quite a few trees but you're still getting useful information from that it um kind of sounds like thermodynamics slash statistical mechanics in some way where you're looking at a bunch of individual things and kind of trying to describe their macroscopic behavior That is, maybe you hit the nail on the head because that's exactly what I'm trying to do with my research is take a step back and look from further back at forests and figure out how best to relate different quantities based on the individuals. So that's where the remote sensing and biodiversity comes from because instead of going into a forest and being like, oh, that's an oak, that's an elm, that's a pine, that's this tree and that tree. Uh, What we would rather do is, say, fly a plane over, take a picture, and then apply some sort of equation to the resulting picture where we can just output, okay, there are 10 trees in the, or 10 different species of trees in the forest. And the cool thing, and exactly why you hit the nail on the head, is that we actually use a lot of different equations and relations from mathematics and physics. Uh, In fact, some of these um indices or ways in which we can quantify different aspects of the forest are called entropy because it's uh, uh kind of the disorder of things yeah entropy yeah entropy has been used a lot in other contexts like 
well, well, but it's also based in physics. Like, well, when I talked about my research, but I'll just mention this now, but entropy can also be derived from information theory, which is the abstract mathematical theory. That's why the concept of entropy, which is a measure of self-information or uncertainties, can be very useful in many, many other areas. But I want to go back a little bit, Patrick, on LIDAR. If I remember correctly, I'm not quite sure how how it works anymore, but you can measure depth using LiDAR. I think that's the main advantage of LiDAR. That's why I think people try to put in cars, in phones, because when you take a picture, normally it's a flat 2D, like two dimensions. But LiDAR gives you the information on depth. Yes. So LiDAR is very useful. Uh, It's almost as old as lasers. However, it's gotten quite a bit more advanced since then. Uh, to the, so I guess the original LiDAR is just a laser rangefinder where you shoot a laser pointer, essentially. It bounces off something, returns to you, and based on the time it takes for that laser beam to leave the rangefinder, hit the object, and come back, you can determine the distance. Now, if you scale that up and make it a bit faster you can have these LiDAR sensors that are able to do that process, so shooting it out and measuring the return hundreds of thousands of times per second up to millions of times per second. So it's a lot more complicated than just shooting one laser beam, but that's the essence of how it works. And the technology really has come from doing it quickly And the reason we do it so quickly is we don't want to be standing there for days if we were using a laser rangefinder to find how many points on a tree are a certain distance away. And then we're also able to achieve higher densities. So if you've ever looked at videos of LiDAR being tested in cars, you can see that it has a live update And you can see different objects moving in that LiDAR and it updates every how many ever times a second. And for cars, that's important because you need it for safety to avoid running into something. For us, we aren't worried about running into something, but we are interested in getting a lot of detail with forests and trees. So are are these IR lasers, visible laser, or like what range of, um, of light or like, do you use like? I I I actually don't know what light I use. I'm 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 guessing it's not visible. Uh it can be visible. So, in my lab, we have two different uh type of lidar sensors. One is visible, and it's green, which is very useful when you're trying to measure forests because the green reflects really easily, and that's why tree leaves are green. Uh, we do also have another one that is infrared, so it's about double the wavelength of the green laser and so that's also useful because plants tend to reflect that region of infrared as well and they don't absorb it that much so we use both visible and infrared lasers i don't think i've heard of anyone using uv lasers and i would imagine that would maybe cause some issues in the field yeah it's, would it be safe because the uv is this is radiation technically and is it can be dangerous, but maybe if it's the if the the power is low, it could be okay. But also things absorb UV pretty well. Yes, including the atmosphere. And one of the benefits of whether you're using infrared or visible lidar is the range. So I think our longest range sensor can go 400 meters, which is a decent amount, especially when you're in a forest. It can go quite far. Whereas if you had a UV laser its range would probably be, if I had to guess, maybe in the tens of meters, if that. But if it's, uh, if it's light, it can be blocked by, by you know, obstacles, right? So are, does everything have to be done from the, from the top view? Like if you just walk into a forest and shine light, most of the light will be blocked by trees right. in front of you. So that's an issue that we have, which is known as occlusion. So it's exactly how you described. If you were to shine a light, it, a tree in the dark, uh, it would create a shadow behind it. So this occlusion is the shadow that's caused where the LiDAR can't see. So in the case of if you're right next to a tree and you try and scan the tree, 
then behind the tree will be in shadow. So we prevent that by moving to different places. So there are some applications of just setting the LiDAR scanner down, doing one scan, and that's all the data you need. But if we're trying to reconstruct things in three dimensions digitally, then we need to have different points of scanning. Uh, I imagine it's kind of like how people like make maps, right? Like there are many people like a probe, right? Really just go around the country, around the world, just building out uh, the geography of the world. Yeah, it, it's, I, I guess, a 3D geography of the world. I have a question. I am. Um... First off, I think it'd be funny if cars use LiDAR, but they use visible light, so it'd just be like a laser show going down the street. <laughs> I think that'd be funny. But um, be cars probably don't use... Like, for, for the cars with LiDAR, like, I've seen, you know, I don't have a car with, with LiDAR, but I see the photos and videos of them driving down the street, and you can see when someone walks on in front of them, it, like, it knows... But surely they don't use lasers because they're so focused to a single point that like, so they must use like some kind of broader light source. No, they do use lasers. So it How is... many lasers is it? Like, because when I think of a laser, I think it, it's so like such a narrow kind of beam that comes out and it can only measure a certain point. So do they just have a ton of lasers in the car? No, uh, typically uh, it will be just one laser. But there's some sort of mechanism, whether it's a tilting mirror or a spinning mm. mirror, that will shoot the laser, will reflect the laser and shoot it out an angle. And this light travels fast enough, very, very fast, that by the time it returns, the mirror hasn't really moved. And so if you get the mirror spinning quite fast, or if you change the angle quite a bit, then you only need one laser. And then it's just dependent on the electronics that you have that can measure if they have a good enough time resolution to measure, okay, we're sending this out, we're receiving the signal back, and now the next one, and the next one. And so these LiDAR scanners can use one laser, but still going at 500,000 sample, 500, samples per second. So they're super fast. That's pretty clever. And it's, it's kind of neat to think about like perspective and you know everything's kind of relative. Yeah, I wonder because is is um, is mirror right? Like, do you have to maintain coherence? And that's hmm. hmm. I haven't. Do you lose any coherence? Well, it's probably just detecting like an out, like an input signal. Probably doesn't matter if it's out of phase or anything. Yeah, but reflecting is absorbing and re-emitting, right? That's what it is. Yeah. Right. In, in this case. Uh, again, that's why LiDAR sensors have a range to some extent. So past 400 meters, say, then the signal is too weak that the noise just takes over. Whereas, say, a space-based or a plane-based LiDAR system, it's a lot more powerful because you don't have people standing in the way sometimes. And so you are able to get a further range. And... That's how LiDAR is actually measured, is it's a beam of light instead of just a single photon kind of thing. And you measure it based on the number of returns. And so these returns are where it's reflected. So if you have uh, a forest with some super tall trees and then still visible from above some shrubs and then the ground, each of those different components will be a return and it will re return a certain amount of the initial light that was shot out from the fancy laser pointer. And so based on those returns, we can tell where each of those heights are relative to, say, the plane that's shooting the laser. I kind of want to touch a little bit on coherence because every laser has coherence length and is basically what limits the usefulness of laser. With laser... I know Liam probably know more. Um, laser is useful because its coherence is directional, right? Like, and coherence is how do you say what co coherence mean? Anyone have a good definition or a good understanding? Oh, jeez! Every time I think I understand it, I I don't. Uh, let's see if I can remember. I thought it was just something to do with phase. Yeah. So it's yeah, yeah. They where have... the laser is in phase with itself over space and time. So everything lines up 
Yeah, it has a constant phase shift. Like, you know. Yeah, if you fire a laser down, um, and like down, I don't know, down the street, and it bounces off a mirror and comes back, it it's like it's non coherent if you're, or if you, I guess you have two lasers, but anyway. No, you can have a phase difference, but have to it has to be constant. I think. Yeah. <laughs> if I remember correctly. Coherence is a big thing in quantum information too. That's the whole why super uh, quantum in, quantum computing is hard to do is because your um your system decoheres and becomes classical and then you lose all the benefits of having a quantum computer. But that's that's another topic for another time. Yeah, let's get out of this rabbit hole. Let's go back to Patrick. <laughs> I love the rabbit holes. The the rabbit holes are fun. Uh, coherence doesn't matter too much for lidar, uh, from what I know. However, it does matter a lot for radar technology because you have a lot longer wavelengths. So you're going to have a lot larger, um, I guess, spaces in which coherence can occur or not occur. Radio waves can be like meters to kilometers long, can't they? They can Something indeed. Like that. Yeah. Well, that's why we have the, the what's it called, AM uh, for the radio, right? Because it can go through basically mountains because they have a, such long wavelength. Well, AM's amplitude modulation, FM's frequency modulation. Yeah, but usually um, the ones on AM are have have a longer wavelength. Yeah, I don't know, um, but I do know that old cars with those big radio antenna. I'm pretty sure. I, I think they had the the length of them have something to do with radio waves. The fact that you have long radio waves, so you need your antenna to be longer to kind of pick up on it. Yeah, that's why your phone has metal trims, right? They can't make it too small because then you won't be able to pick up signal. Yeah, well, I guess like Wi-Fi and stuff is radio waves, right? Uh, I Technically, those are microwaves and a lot of the radio waves yeah. that oh. are used in remote sensing or other applications are actually microwaves. So they're lying to you. Damn. Yeah, your phone's a microwave, um, like the phone signal the wi-fi well that makes in uh, gigahertz i well, think i was gonna say that makes a lot more sense because you know phones are small well, well if you remember the uh if your radio sh- show would be like 100 megahertz or something like that but wi-fi if you look at it it's like five five gigahertz and that was an issue with the introduction of 5g was it was a shorter wavelength so it could sc- stream more information over the same amount of time, but it also can travel through buildings as easily. So that's a problem they're still dealing with. Yeah, you just need more towers. Yeah, you just need hollow walls. That's all you need. Just drill holes in all the walls everywhere. Or Don't let the wi- You gotta let the Wi-Fi out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's more important, your privacy or your internet? Uh, I mean. I'd say internet, honestly, you know. No internet over <laughs> privacy. Like, that's a tough one. You talk like a true 21st century man. <laughs> yeah, well, what can I say? <laughs> All right, to get back to Patrick again. So is this... So do you do a lot of spectral analysis? Uh, so... Yes, there is a lot of spectral analysis that can be done. Again, we can take that data in many different ways from a handheld probe with a special backpack contraption uh, all the way up to satellite imagery of a full spectral response. So going from 350 nanometers all the way up to 2,500 nanometers. So going from the just ultraviolet all the way to the um, kind of getting into the longer waves of infrared. So there's a lot of information that's not invisible light that we can tell about plants. Uh, a good example of this is if we want to tell how dead a forest is or how dead plants are, we can compare the amount of light that comes in from just at the infrared um, line to the red line. Uh, and we compare that to usually red and we can get a quantifiable number from that. And depending on where that number sits, you're either going to have more or less water, essentially, in your vegetation, which shows you that, oh, it's probably dead, or we're in a drought, or it's doing really well, and it's healthy. 
Well, if it's infrared, is it a is a matter of heat? Um, just try to measure are uh, living plants has more heat than dead plants because dead plants would not produce anything, right? Uh, right. So it's somewhat to do with heat. However, we look at shorter waves, l- wavelengths of infrared. So not all infrared is from heat. And when we're looking at forests, we tend to look at the reflection of a light source. So in this case, if we're scanning the forests using a satellite, we're looking at how they reflect the sun, which is a pretty decent white light. Uh, There are some ways, uh, for example, if we're trying to monitor forest fires in a forest, then we can fly at night so we don't have that reflection of the sun and scan for slightly longer wavelengths and see if there's heat in an area. However, typically we're looking more so at the reflectance of the sun rather than any heat that's produced by the plants themselves. But if it's forest fire, it should be much easier because um, fire produce like almost all range of infrared and visible. <laughs> yes, fi- fires are very easily monitored and we're actually currently looking into ways in how we can monitor them better using drones and having fancy cameras on them which can detect even places where there's not visible light but there's still heat that can catch other things on fire can preemptively predict them exactly the goal Uh, i imagine right yes uh so we're using uh that dryness index that i was talking about which is ndvi and we're also using machine learning to try and determine okay uh, if this area is dry, then maybe focus on this area for fire prevention methods. Or working in real time saying, okay, we know this area is dry. There's a fire right here. The wind is blowing this way. How will the fire move and how will it spread? So there's a lot of work that can be done in that area. Cool. I um, I remember that you went on a little trip recently to uh, to do some of that research. Would you mind talking about that i haven't really heard too much about it since you've gotten back well uh so for those of you who may not be in the know i went to costa rica for some field work for three weeks so my area of interest for forests are tropical dry forests which are seasonally dry forests so for those of you living in the northern hemisphere up in canada or Europe or somewhere, you'll know that we get snow and we get sun and it changes throughout the year. Now, instead of snow and sun, they get lots of sun and then lots of rain. So they go through, these forests go through periods of drought and then a lot of wet. And they aren't that well studied compared to rain forests, which are uh, a bit more popular just because they, um, they, they capture the attention of people early on. But these forests are found in Costa Rica. The area of Costa Rica, in particular, is Santa Rosa National Park, which is a protected site, but was previously used for farmland and grazing land for cattle. So almost all the forests in the site are regrowth from when they protected the site and said, okay, no more farming. We're just going to let things grow naturally. And so down there, I was able to do some of these drone flights that I've been talking about, as well as actually going into the forests, measuring out sections of the forest so that we can monitor them long term, and then using LIDAR scanners and different types of specialized cameras to take data about the forest. What kind of uh, kind of animals or critters you see down there? I mean, not, not to shift the conversation from physics, <laughs> but biology. Yeah. There are a lot of interesting critters down there. Lots of deer that are not really afraid of people. And it's the same white-tailed deer that we have in Canada, just not beefy because they don't need the winter fat. Mm. There's lots of different rodents. For those of you interested, go search up pictures of Watuza. Good luck spelling it, but go search it up. It's a very cute rodent that's like a mini beaver capybara thing. There 
were a ton of spiders, and my definition of a large spider has changed significantly. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, I was the one to have to shoo spiders out of the room, and there were a couple big ones. Also lots of frogs, very few snakes this time of year, and very few amphibians, just because they are trying to avoid those drought conditions, which is when we went down during a drought. Lots of monkeys too. There were definitely monkeys. And the other major thing, aside from birds, are jaguars. So Jeez. wild cats. And we met this very cool guy on the beach one day. He surfed in to come talk to us. So already pretty cool. And he researches jaguars and sea turtles. Because in this region, the sea turtles are so plentiful that the jaguars hunt them and then this biologist goes and he tracks a jaguar after it's made a kill will scare the jaguar away from its kill tie up the turtle to a tree set up a camera and then get out of there the jaguar will feast on the turtle and then this guy will come back later find the remnants and then take the camera and go so there's some pretty crazy stuff that goes on down there. Man, that guy sounds badass, like surfing in to do his work and then Yeah. Geez. Possibly one of the coolest guys I've ever met. The closer to the equator you are, the more diverse in terms of wildlife it is, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, turtles only come to lay eggs like not very often, maybe once every year or two or even three years and it's a rare sight to see if you see a bunch of turtles come up to the beach start laying eggs and you know it's, it's such a rare opportunity too and these jaguars just you know go on a feast yes and those turtles from what i've been told you can't see the sand when it's their laying season so it's it's a party for jaguars i imagine other than that there is also a lot of different trees in Costa Rica. So apart from the animal side, the tree side of things, typically we're used to maybe five or six different species if we're lucky in a forest in Canada, unless you're maybe in BC in the more temperate rainforest area. But here there are 50, 60, 70 different types of tree species in, in one, say, hectare area. So it's really quite different going there and seeing these different types of trees and just so many different types of trees. And the other thing that they have there are their woody vines. So mm. if you picture these green vines that people swing from in the jungle, put that out of your head and just imagine like a tree stump or a, a tree trunk that's winding throughout different trees in the forest. And these are called lianas and they're actually an invasive species. And part of what my uh, lab is studying. I, I do some work with them, but they are everywhere and becoming more of a problem. Yeah, what I find not so fun when I go into like a tr more tropical forest are two things: leeches and what is this one called? Slugs, ah. but the the blood sucking slugs, not the normal slugs. You know, those one not fun because you don't feel it when when they you know when they feast on you. You know, they release that little um, what's it called uh, painkiller anesthetic uh, fluids yeah. thing. Yeah, anesthetics. So you can't feel it, and you're like, oh my god, there's a fat slug. I was gonna say how many uh, feasting on my blood. How many tropical forests have you guys been in? Because I definitely have not been in any. <laughs> Well, I'm from Thailand, so I've been through a few. Didn't yeah. you tell me at one point they had like jumping, flying tree leeches or something? Yeah, jumping, yeah, jumping tree leeches, like a tropical oh rainforest. It's very really diverse. You see all kind of things, right? I'll stick. Yeah. yeah, and the thing is, they release those um anticoagulant to to if you just pull it off, you just keep bleeding. <laughs> Jeez, like I can't imagine living somewhere with jumping tree leeches. That is scary. So I'm curious, Feely, how how much of Thailand is forest? It used to be a lot. Oh god. <laughs> and you know, a lot of illegal forest like forestry and uh, it it's gone down quite a bit, but now it's 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 getting better, hopefully, <laughs> that they try to crack down on it. And we still have pretty diverse um wildlife. Um the, the apex predators 
are sometimes getting hunted for trophies, but in terms of the lower level things, are I think they're still okay. I'm not sure about it. I would have to fact check myself. But um, from from people I know, you know, they still go to the, the to, you know to walk in the forest or to go kind of camping, and they still see things that you wouldn't see if the you know diversity is low. You won't see like butterflies. You won't see earthworms if the soil are bad. Or there's like a bunch of indicators that are wildlife that you can basically try to see if the forest is healthy. Like you say, you use remote sensing to look at um, um, life in the forest, but I think more more historically, people don't have that kind of technology. So what they do, is these you know experts just go and look for certain kind of wildlife that only flourish if and only if the forest is teeming with life, basically. Yeah, just just use your eyes. Come on. <laughs> uh, just to uh, uh, throw that in there, I believe those species are called uh, keystone species. So they're ones that help define a mm. an ecosystem. So they're like the keystone for an arch bridge. They're this pivotal species that can indicate the health of a whole ecosystem. Are those keystone species usually like lower on the food chain, upper on the food chain, or does it is it different everywhere? They they tend to be a bit higher on the food chain, so you wouldn't be seeing algae or fish or well, little fish on there. You'll you'll see probably something that's more of a a predatory animal. Uh, I'm just trying to think of a good example of one. Like wolves. I mean, if you yeah. don't have wolf in the forest, yeah, yeah like it, especially yes. in, in North America, wolves are the indicator because like if wolves can survive, I mean, deer can survive. That means yeah, I guess you know, the food, the, the whole thing, the food, the the animal's food needs food. And exactly. It, yeah. yeah, the food chain basically. There's a really interesting thing that I would encourage people to go check out, and it's the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone. It's oh yeah, fascinating to see the results. And also, they didn't de- re- like introduce that many either. It was like a few, right? It's not even that many. Yes. Uh, going back to what you were talking about earlier, though, going into a forest and actually trying to find these species and everything, that's the overall goal of my research, is to make sure that we can have easier methods to observe a forest. So we don't have to take the time to go in and measure these trees or keystone species instead we can try and monitor them from afar and with the advancements in remote sensing it's becoming easier and easier and hopefully that will lead to more available funding which will lead to more research going into this and i guess the overall end goal is to increase the conservation or awareness of areas at risk or point out areas that are okay to use the resources. Nice. So, so that's Patrick's research in a nutshell, basically. It looks like we've been talking for quite a while, and I would like to go into a little bit of our kind of reach us reaching out, like how how do how do people find us and how do you contact us, Patrick? Would you like to, you know, touch on that? Yes. So we now have an email. We can be contacted at hyperthesis podcast at gmail.com. So it's just the title, which you will see in the nice image that Feely has done, uh, plus podcasts at gmail.com. We also have an Instagram account. It is the hyperthesis. So feel free to give us a follow. We don't have much there right now, but we will be sending out notifications of episodes and different awareness things for upcoming episodes just to get it hyped up a little bit. So make sure to give us a follow on Instagram. And we may be expanding into other social media, but those are what we have for now. One thing could be a good exercise for the listeners is to try to fact check it. Like, you know, just make sure we're saying things right. If it's incorrect, just let us know and we will try to rectify that or, you know, say that in the next episode what we did wrong. And <laughs> I'm sure as a um, scientist, being wrong is a part of our daily life. And as a student, being wrong is is 99% of the time. 
now. Yeah. And also, if you have suggestions for what you would like to hear us talk about, or if you want to see someone else that's not us, uh, come and visit and we can ask them questions about their research or topic. Feel free to let us know about those suggestions as well. Yeah, we know some some people who do some cool things, so going to get them in here one day. <laughs> All right. So I think the next is the last part, which is story time. So today, since we talk about a lot about, you know, the world, the globe, diversity, I would like to go into how we actually navigate the world. As you know, now we have planes, we have cars, we have ships, we have boats. Uh, but back in the days when you want to go long distance, it's only by sailing. And I think the almost like the golden age of uh, naval navigate uh, naval um, traveling was in the 1700s. You know, when people start to explore the new world, try to figure out how to navigate, basically how to how to go north, south, west, and east um, accurately. So sailors and navigation in 1700s were huge and a big a large portion of navigation is due to celestial bodies or stars the sun and people use tools like the sex the sextant to basically help navigate or find where you are in the world so as most of you hopefully know that in if you look at a globe you know as the that sphere or on any map you can see two types of lines the latitudes and the longitudes so the latitudes are the horizontal lines you know and the longitudes are the vertical lines so the, the latitudes tell you basically where you are north to south and the longitudes tell basically your time zone so if you remember how to set your time zone in your in your phone in your computers those are, are determined by the longitude lines and how do people measure them? So back in the days, people use stars and the sun. So for imagine for the latitude, so it's the horizontal lines, because the sun goes up and down from east to west. So you can get the horizontal lines easily by just pointing sextant at the sun and measure the angle between the sun, the ship, and the horizon. So, so at noon, the sun is supposed to be somewhere, so in the middle of the sky. So, but if you add a different latitude, so you can compare where the sun is at the, or what, <clears throat> where the horizon, uh, the, sorry, the angle between sun, ship, and horizon at noon. So that we have different angle. So you can get the latitude from that comparing to like a table called the nautical almanac, which is the positions of celestial bodies. However, the challenge is the longitude because you know how, how do you measure longitude? The sun would be at noon in the middle of the sky. That's, you don't have a clock. You didn't have a clock at the time. So this became a big problem. And in 1707, this is called the uh, Skilly's naval disasters where people, the sailors lost their lives. Thus, it was thought to be around 1,400 to 2,000 sailors lost their lives in in Skilly's, which is the Isles of Skilly's, southwest England. So in October 22nd, basically, and the English government just you know, got tired with inaccurate navigation because those accidents are Incidents happened because we didn't have a way to you know, fight basically the the latitude accurately, and so you couldn't avoid a bunch of rocks somewhere that people you know located before. So the longitudinal acts were passed. So basically, these acts were cash prices. It's around five million U.S. dollars today for anyone who can find a way to measure longitudes accurately and. Those way has to be um, operable on a ship which has turbulence, have to go through you know cruel sea. So this guy, 
John Harrison, an English carpenter, and he was you know, d- building clocks at the same time, but you know, doing it amateurly. So he, he decided to work on this problem. So the idea that he came up with is that, well, to measure the longitude, you have to be able to measure time. Why? Because if longitude tells you the time zone, if you know the time in certain place, then you can f- use that as a reference point, and you see when when it's noon in your reference clock, and you can measure the the position of the sun to figure out the time where you are, and then you can figure out the discrepancy between that and calculate where you are. In term on the longitudes, so the problem is to that to build a reliable clock at sea. So, this guy spent seven years building this first clock, namely H one, Harrison one, basically, and you know he tested on the rivers, and then finally get to test it on actual ship HMS Centurion on the trip to Lisbon. And apparently, the clock worked so well it actually saved the ship, which was off course. So he present this to the board of longitude, which is you know deciding the longitude acts. However, the board of longitude at the time was made up of of astronomers who were really wasn't really into the idea that this machine. Doesn't use the power of the stars, or didn't have to look at the stars to work. It's just a clock, so they just didn't like it that much. So they just gave him two hundred and fifty pounds and told him that, well, if you make another, um, if you can make another one like that's improved in two years, they will give him a, another two hundred and fifty pounds. So Harrison was. Going at it, so he spent actually three years to uh, decide a second design, but he still found some flaws, and he then spent the next nineteen years trying to come up with a new version. And the problem he also found that the problem was it's so large. The H one, H two, H three, the clock were really big. So it's going to be a problem when you go through in the ocean, have the turbulence, has really strong currents. So, in 1751, for many years after he first started, he devised a smaller one, which kind of looked like a large pocket watch that we have now, or <laughs> we have back in the days, a you know, big pocket watch. And even when he had that, the board of longitude still. You know, didn't believe it. They claimed that you know, no clock can be that accurate, and deny Harrison any prize money. So Harrison got really mad, and he supports her too. So they actually complained to the king about that. You know, this is unfair that the board just threw away his idea and his invention. So the king actually agreed on another round of testing, and it works. So Harrison's clock works magnificently. So the board decided to award ten thousand pounds to Harrison. So Harrison also get another ten thousand pounds in installments if it can be proven that uh, they can basically manufacture it to put it in auto ships and all the ships. So basically, that the story of someone <laughs> try to. Put a mark in a history and find a way to actually navigate these vicious waters, and by just using the, a clock instead of having to rely on the stars and the sun. Oh, you have to rely on the sun, but not as much. If you can look at the clock, and this invention becomes, you know, one of the most accurate clocks of its time, and even now, I think. A few years ago, uh, maybe a decade or so ago, people built his、uh, blueprint. Blueprint that he made of the accurate clock that his final design, and it found that is quite accurate. I think it's in like an eighth of a second、um, every day or something like that. Which 
if you have a mechanical watch, that's you know that's it's really nice to have. And it was a pendulum clock, if I remember correctly. So that's the story of Harrison and how to navigate the the waters back in seventeen hundreds. So. Pretty impressive accuracy for a clock back then. Yeah. It is worth noting that uh, one of the people who, one of the astronomers was Edmund Haley or Halley. So some pretty famous people going up against Harrison. <laughs> well, but his legacy can still be seen today on you know, people's. So I think we're, uh, I think we should start wrapping up soon. Eh? Yeah. I think there's a nice little, yeah. uh, nice little quote to summarize today's uh, session by Edwin Hubble that a uh, man explores the universe oh sorry equipped with his five senses man explores the universe around him and he calls the adventure science and I think that kind of that wraps up Patrick's research and and uh this this clock story you know people they're just trying to figure things out and then we get we get a clock out of it maybe we'll get some ways to predict forest fires in the future from Patrick's work. Who knows? All right. So I think that's a wrap. Yeah. So we will come back next week. So thank you for joining us and listening. Yeah. Thanks a bunch. Take care. <laughs>